Just in case you wondered, there is indeed an online community for every niche interest, hobby, uh, pastime, craft. And uh, so if I tell you that uh, there is an online knitting community, this shouldn't be a surprise. These communities are gathered in, in online forums and blogs and podcasts and YouTube channels. And, uh, and, and in the past year, there has been a major controversy in the online fiber arts community. And it's very important. Fiber arts is knitting and crocheting, which is different. I did not know this until my wife explained. But in the online fiber arts community, there has been this very interesting controversy unfolding about race. And it started with a lady making a post, a blog post, about how excited she was to go to India, um, talking about uh, using, describing this trip in some very unintentionally racially charged language. And so people started telling stories of their experience of race in the knitting community of uh, people who are black going into a store for the first time. And if you've ever been to a, a knitting store, there's always a table in back with some tea or some coffee, and there's a circle of some number of ladies back there knitting, right? That's just what you do. You go, you knit. And, and so this black lady would come in for her first time going to a store, and she'd start looking at the fiber and all the, and no one would come up and talk to her. And then she's, well, maybe I'm new, maybe that, and then another lady uh, came in who was white, and, um, and, and someone from that table came to her and said, Yo, oh, we're so glad you're here for the first time, like ushered her back to the table. And, and like, she was shocked by this. And other stories of an Asian lady who went to the knitting store and went up to buy some stuff, fluffy stuff, and um, which I appreciate greatly the product of, but I do not understand at all. Uh, but to buy some stuff in, in the shop, the clerk told her, oh, I didn't know Asians could knit or Asians knitted. And it's like, what? what? And, and so this is like an ongoing discussion right now in the fiber arts community. <laughs> And so, if you will forgive the pun, it seems that race is woven into the fabric of our culture. Race matters in knitting, it also matters in the church. Bob Farr recently was talking to a group of, uh, uh, he's been going around the conference talking to people about the results of the special session and general conference. And one of the things he's been sharing all across the state was that neither himself nor his predecessor, so 50, last 15 years, have been able to make a cross-racial appointment. Haven't been able to. And so what that means is right now, like we are preparing at this annual conference at the beginning of June, we will approve two new trained, qualified pastors who are black to go to another state because we cannot find a church that is willing to accept them as their pastor. And this is bad. I, this is a very bad thing. Um, race matters in knitting. Race matters in the church. Race matters in schools. In January of this year at Blue Valley Northwest, a school in Kansas City, a magazine, 435 Magazine, focuses reporting on Kansas City, talk, told the story of a student, Camille, who was told that the reason she could not be on the, the national com, com, uh, competing dance team was, and I quote, her skin was too dark, and the audience would look at her, not the other dancers. Her skin color clashed with the costumes. So she is then cut from performances her, her junior and senior year. Uh, at senior night, which is like a big deal, all the, after, uh, the football, basketball, everyone's being acknowledged and it comes up the dance team, time to acknowledge their seniors and, and she is the only senior that the dance team does not acknowledge. Uh, and so this, this, is this is unfolding right now in, in Kansas City. It's an ongoing legal matter. And, and so I, I would like to submit to you that this ain't working, right? This, um, the way that our culture handles race is not working. Now, I don't want to say that it wasn't worse. Like, I've recently learned of the existence of something called the Green Book. Has anyone heard of uh, Green Books? Okay, you know more than I did. The Negro Motorist Green Book was a little book that you would get that would tell you where the sundown towns were, the places where you better be out of there before the sun came down, went down or else your, your life could be at risk. Like, that used to 
be a very real reality. And, and the fact that we don't have to worry about that, that's good. But for me to, but that just because it was worse then does not make now good. It was worse then, and now it is less bad. Now, we're obviously talking about race today, and I can just say for myself, I'd rather not be doing this. Right? I don't want to talk about this. Race ends up making people very uncomfortable, including myself. As I was studying about this, uh, prepared to be able to talk about this, hopefully in a learned fashion, I came across the term white fragility. It's this idea that... We just get really, really uncomfortable, and we change the topic as quickly as possible. And here are the two ways I've heard I use to change the topic, my own personal experience, is I've heard the dodge of uh, people just need to work. They just need to work and make good decisions, and that's what matters to me. Right? Just people, don't care what color your skin is, just work. Um, I, the other dodge I've heard to change the topic is, can we just focus on economics? Like, let's talk about economics, talk about that, talk about that's what matters. And I will confess that I've used both of those. I repent. I was wrong. Like, I don't want to talk about this as much as anyone else. But um, part of what makes this so hard to talk about, why we want to dodge the topic so much, is that the way we discuss racism is as, like, there's two options, and only two. There are good people, and then there are those bad people, those racist people who make decisions based upon on color, right? To make decisions based upon race. And I can tell you stories of good people and bad people. I can tell you the story of a church that has told the bishop that they would rather have any white pastor, no matter how incompetent, over having a competent black pastor. Like, I can tell you stories of families that have, like, can we just all agree we all have a story floating around back there that we've heard about, like, blatant racism. And you can say, oh, that person, they were racist. But, and then what happens is, we end up in this, the way the discussion unfolds is, well, there's people who make decisions like that, and those are bad people, but I don't make decisions like that, so I'm a good person, right? We're good people, there are bad people, I don't choose to be racist in how I live, and so we don't have to talk about racism because we're good people, we don't choose to do that, so why are we talking about it, Andy? Does that sound familiar? Right? Here's what I would suggest. Racism is, racism is not about dividing people into good people and bad people, non-racists and racists. Racism is something very different. Racism is what is woven into our culture, which is then handed down to us. It is a culture we inherit. Like no one, no one here got a vote in what culture you were born into, right? We inherited the situation as we were born into, and then we make our impact on culture and we pass it along. Right? Culture can be shifted and changed. The, the fact that if you walk into a hospital, they will stabilize you so that you don't die in the emergency room, and they'll do that before asking if you have any money. Like, that's a change in culture. There were times earlier in history when if you didn't have money, you just die. Right? And so that's a change in culture. Thank you, Christian monastic orders. Right? That, that's a good thing. Right? So we, we inherit this culture, and we do what we can with it, and we pass it on, and woven into the culture that we have inherited is the existence of racism which I understand racism to be a sinful pattern in the distribution of power. Right? Sin racism is this, this sinful pattern in our culture of how we distribute power. And to tell this story, we need to go back. And so I'm going to tell a short story, and I will tell you that this is as researched as I can make it, and I will inevitably miss a detail. And if I do, please tell me. I, this is as good as I can give you. Tell me where I whiff. The word white was not used until 1600s American English colonial law. And so if you went back to 1500s and you asked someone in Europe, are you white? They would have looked at their skin and said, no, I'm actually kind of a light brown. I'm peach. Right? If you asked, what are you, to someone in Europe, what they would have said is, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Prussian, or I'm Austrian. Germany didn't exist yet. But like, I'm French, or, or I'm, I'm English. Or they might have said, you know, I'm Lutheran, or I'm Catholic. They would not, the idea of identifying someone by a color did not exist. And so in the 1600s, the, in colonial law, the term white was used, 
as a category created to keep track of who was the slave and who was the master. It was a property organizational social structure. Right? It became a power thing that became part of our culture. That white was people from Europe who owned black people from Africa. It's a comparatively new idea in the scope of human history. And so black develops when you take people from all over Western Africa and you strip them across the sea and they, they lose their language and they lose their tribe or their nation, their family, all that stripped. And, and so they, they have a new, uh, they're taught English and their children are taught English and they're given a new religion. And, and that is where black comes from. It's not an idea that comes from Africa. There's a, a guy who teaches at Duke, Father Emmanuel Katangale. And as you might guess, he is both from Africa and he's a Catholic priest, right? And so he comes to America and he's going to be a priest here. And he shows up in America and he goes to a church and someone tells him that he's black. And he looks at his skin and says, no, I'm actually dark brown. What is this black? Like, and he was offended that someone assumed that they knew something about him because of his skin, which really wasn't black. It's dark brown. You can look it up. These pictures on the Duke website. Right? He, he's brown. Why does that? What, what, what do you know about me? Right? And so, this is part of why the question of like Black History Month exists. Why does Black History Month exist? Because what's the rest of the history we're taught? Like, I am a student of history. If you haven't figured that out yet, I love learning history, right? And, and I have been paying attention K-12, two degrees. I have been reading and I've been doing all the homework because I love it, doing all the history. And um, the history that I have been taught, I can go back to 600 B.C. and tell you the history all the way to the present of... Europe, right? In America. I don't know anything about African history. Does anyone here know anything about African history? Right? We don't. Because the other 11 months of the year are history. White history. And then so to have a Black History Month is to acknowledge that there's other history out there that's not about me. Right? That, that's part of why, why we need to talk about this. In America, the, the ability to be determined to be white is important, right? It has mattered. At, in 1925, Armenians took a, cor a, a case all the way to the Supreme Court so that they could be white, to be legally declared white. 1925, right? This would matter a lot to be considered white. And the irony of this is Armenians, they're from Eastern Europe, the Caucasus. You know where we get the term Caucasian? It's the people of Eastern Europe. If there ever was a people who should be by default called white, it would be Armenians. Like, they're white as can be. Just, just their, their skin. That's how, how it is, right? And, and so they went to the court. And the courts declared them to be white. And here is the logic of it. The, 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 the justices of the early part of the 20th century, here is the logic of who is white. White is whoever other white people says is white. That's the logic. That's the, that's the judicial logic of the time. And that didn't include Asians. And so like, I was surprised to learn, you know, Mr. Sulu on Star Trek? Dude's Asian. His family was locked up during World War II because they weren't white. He was in California, and we locked up a bunch of Asians. And, and, and that, was, that was part of white, not white. I know a lady in St. Louis named Angela who's doing fascinating research, uh, uh, getting a, a, a graduate degree in history, and she's looking at the role of Chinese in the Civil War. Did you know there were some Chinese who fought in the Civil War? Like, I didn't know this either. Fascinating area. And, and there weren't a lot of them, but there were some. And, and depending upon where they lived and what the people around them thought determined whether they were on the side of the North fighting against slavery, or fighting for slavery in the South because the people around them considered them white, or they were part of being enslaved or indentured servants in the South. It was like, they're Chinese. They're not black, they're not white, but the, group, the people around them decided what they would be, and that created their reality. That created how they lived, whether they were considered white or, or not white. 
The more that I study and listen and learn, the more that I am convinced that white and black only exist because we believe that they do. They are categories that are entirely socially constructed. Kind of like sports fans. Does it really matter whether you, care, you root for the Cardinals or the Royals? It does, doesn't it? Why does it? It does because we believe it does. Right? It does, it's a socially constructed category. So, and so, except the black and white socially constructed categories have a lot more impact. We reinforce these socially constructed categories because we see what impact they have had, and then we believe in them, and they can, we continue to reinforce the impact that they have had. And so the continuing impact of this story that there are white people and black people is that, uh, so, Banks decide who can get homes, right? If you can't get a mortgage, you can't get a home. And so how do banks make decisions about who can afford a home? They decide who is responsible and who can be trusted. Would I be shocking anyone when I said that sometimes the decision who to trust with money has not always been just based on money? Now, if you look up the history of what's called redlining, um, you can find this history of how people have been allowed to buy homes in certain areas. And so if you are black and you are only allowed to buy houses in areas of lower uh, property value, property value matters because what determines how well funded your school is? Your property value. And so if you can only buy a house in an area with a low property value and so you have a lesser funded school, and, and then we talked a few weeks ago about how if you're not reading by the third grade, your ability to break cycles of generational poverty is, is very limited, right? And so if you are living in an area with low property values with less <laughs> schools that don't function as well and your children are not able, able to break, break cycles of poverty and then if you have high poverty areas we police them more highly, blacks make up 13% of the American population. They make up 40% of the prison population. Right? That, 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 that's horrifying to hear. And, and so then, without access to quality education, with so many black men in prison, black families in America have not accrued wealth. Because it's hard to work when you're in prison. And so the median income of a white, scratch that, the median wealth of a white family, the most average amount of wealth a white family has is $171,000. All assets minus all debts. That median wealth of a black family is $17,600. Like, that, that's the numbers. A white family most likely is gonna have about $171,000 of assets. A black family is most likely to have $17,600 in assets. My friends, whether I mean well or not, whether I've ever had a racist inclination or not, whether I have ever met a black person or not, that's the situation we have inherited. Those are the numbers, like that's what we got. I find it useless and distracting to accuse people of racism in such a situation. Because have you ever known someone, man, I think you're racist. Someone go, I think you're right. Like, th does it help? Like, I think you're racist. No, I'm not. Like, that's the end of the discussion. It doesn't help. It doesn't make a difference. To, to deal with guilt and shame about the situation we have inherited, you know, this is what we got. Racism and its consequences are baked into our culture and the question is not what any of us intended, it is what we do in response. Race matters. The current situation, it ain't good. And racism is a pattern, a, a social construct of the distribution of power that we have inherited in our culture. Now the only way I can dare to be this brazenly, brazenly honest about this challenge is because I have a profound hope based upon following Jesus that we have a way forward. 
I know there is a better way forward, rooted in following the good news which God offers in Scripture. A way forward that does not give up in cynicism. Man, that's just the way it is. A way forward that does not condone this situation as impossible to change. A way forward based upon reading Scripture and seeing again and again that as people who follow the living God, we are called to look at strangers as a gift. If you read in Deuteronomy 10, you shall love the stranger, for you were strangers in Egypt. You were strangers, foreigners, outcasts, aliens in Egypt. You remember what that was like. Leviticus 19, the alien, the stranger who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen. You shall love the alien as yourself. Heard that before? For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Whoever is strange to you, for whatever reason, race, anything, right? Welcome them. For you are the people of God who are strangers in the land of Egypt. When we read the book of Job, if you remember the book of Job, Job is protesting his innocence to his three friends. And what, one of the things he protests to prove that he has done what is right before God, he says, I was a father to the needy. I championed the cause of the alien, the stranger. It becomes part of the worship of Israel. In Psalm 149, the Lord watches over the strangers. Praise the Lord. We hear it in the call of the prophets. For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, you will truly act justly as one another. If you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood, then I will dwell with you in this place. That's how Jeremiah puts it. You think about how often Jesus talks about feeding people when they are hungry, loving your neighbor without any restriction. It's love your neighbor. It's not love your neighbor who looks like you or acts like you. It's love your neighbor. And then Paul goes on again and again about how in Christ there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. Finally, we read in Hebrews 13, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so some have entertained angels without knowing it. And I find this to be the most instructive. This is like the capstone on all of it. I read these pieces of it. I can give you pages more of these types of scriptures if you would like to, to follow this theme. But what Hebrews is, is a book by a Jew to other Jewish people about how to welcome Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. And this argument is based upon going back to Abraham, how he welcomes people to his table that he does not know that are strange to him, and they bring him the good news that he will have a son. And in the same way, we welcome Jesus who is strange to us. And he offers us the good news of forgiveness and salvation. There is no one more strange to us than Jesus, for he is perfect, and we are not. And we welcome him, and he brings us good news. And so as people who follow Jesus today, we are citizens of the kingdom of God to come, of heaven. And we, we respond to division that occurs in our culture, no matter what basis it is on, by being ambassadors of reconciliation, seeking out people who are strange to us, and taking care of them, and loving them, and listening to them, and help listening so that they can help us see what we don't see. When Olivia and I read the initial post that started off the entire hubbub in the knitting community, we didn't see what the problem was. Like, to, so for this lady who was talking about going to India, and she was talking, portraying it as exotic and strange, and compared it like going to another planet, like going to Mars. Like, I didn't catch what the problem was. Well, here's the problem. What if you're from India, and you've come to America, and someone is saying that your home, your, where you came from is like Mars? Are you going to feel like you're being welcomed if you're from such a strange area? I mean, we've literally, if you're from India, this lady has just literally called you an alien. You are really strange to me. It's, I, I didn't catch that. I came across this turn of phrase that I'm finding more and more helpful that, yes, whatever you understand to be true is true, but there is more to reality than what the truth that you know. We need people to bring us other ways of seeing because there's more out there to see than we have yet seen. This is what Jesus does for us. He brings us good news that we don't otherwise hear. I don't find it productive to blame people, right? You are good people, you are bad people, you're racist, you're not racist. It doesn't help. It continues to support this binary approach, and race is complicated. It is woven into our culture, and it's not going to get solved overnight. 
All right, these patterns and powers of power distribution take time. Right, it's going to take a while. Our response to racism will take a while as well. It begins by seeing people that are different from us, that are strange to us, as gifts. All right? To listen to people whose experiences are shocking and to, instead of shutting down, to spend the time to learn. I'm hearing more and more recently about um, black people and Second Amendment rights. Like, and if you go back into the history, the, the Second Amendment does not seem to equally apply. And if you go back into the history of it, if you look up Ronald Reagan, California, and gun rights, you'll find a, a moment in which Ronald Reagan was taking guns away. I mean, the, like, consummate, like, doesn't that capture your attention? How did that happen? Ronald Reagan, like, Captain Conservative. Like, there's a history here. If we listen to it, it is there. And so we search and we read and, and we try to understand. I, I just finished reading a book called Between the World and Me. And I disagreed with a goodly chunk of it, but I listened. And now I understand a little bit more about what it means for a black father to talk to a black son about racism in America. I needed to listen. Right? We realize that we listen and we understand and that our intentions are good, but it's the results that matter when it comes to this. Like, I don't see anyone here intending to be racist, but the results of culture today, what we have inherited, are there, there are racist trends. And to change these are going to take time. And it, part of how we do that is to change our language. There is language we use that is racially charged. Stuff we can say without ever saying race, that is, like, if I talk about, I, I used to say this phrase in the last year, I've had to stop, talk about something being really ghetto. Did I ever say the word black there? No, but y'all know what I meant. I was listening to a story of one lady talking about um, how she got a really good deal moving to a place in New Orleans, and she got a really good deal. But now she had to buy a gun because she was, she was concerned about being safe. All right, and what did she just say? Did I say the word black? No, but if you move to the city, get a really good deal, need to buy a gun for your own safety, you've just, that's a racially charged statement. And to be able just to say, like, what you getting at? Why are you worried? We're not going to get anywhere unless we get used to at least talking about it. Race matters. And that's not going to change anytime soon, this side of the kingdom of heaven. Now, if nothing else, when it comes to language, we can stop laughing at jokes. And people tell jokes and just don't laugh. It's simple. Just, it's not funny. As we listen and understand again and again, the funny thing about strangers is the more you listen to them, they cease to be strange. And if that sounds like what we're called to do as people who are sent as reconcilers, ambassadors of Jesus Christ, well, that, that's right. We are sent to people on behalf of Jesus to be reconciled with people who are strange to us as Jesus reconciled with us who are strange to him. We talk about such brokenness as we're heading towards the cross. We dare to do so because it is in the cross where all reconciliation begins. Thanks be to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.